Hi, everyone. Welcome to Crossroads, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Alyssa Adams, and I'm a research scientist at Cross Labs, and I'll be your host for today. So this series is run by Cross Labs, a research institute here in Kyoto, Japan, aimed at understanding the mind through computational research. Here at Cross Labs, we explore ideas about brain science, information science, AI, artificial life, changes in society, and all sorts of other cool topics. The cross and crossroads means uh, the bridge between many different dis disciplines between minds and intelligence research, because it takes a lot of different perspectives to understand these questions. We're supported by Cross Compass, the leading AI company here in Japan. Every month, we talk about intelligence and what parts of the sciences help us understand a bit more We're about what they are, how they interact with the world, and how we might make them from scratch. This is our monthly fun forum where we invite cool and exciting speakers from a wide variety of backgrounds to share about their research, and we have an exciting discussion on these topics. As usual, this will be in two parts, the first being our guest speaker and a Q&A session, and then the second being a uh, a discussion offline uh, off of YouTube on Zoom. We're going to post the Zoom link in the chat, so free, feel free to join us there after this. And for the Q&A, we have a Slido link that people can use to ask questions. We'll post it later, or you can ask them in the chat in on YouTube. So now I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Hello. Hi. <laughs> So we have Anne Tu Nguyen joining us. Um, she is a doctoral level, uh, level research student at Ritsumeiken Ritsu University here in Japan. And she explores the relationship between travel and tourism in video games. And in her free time, she streams her own video game adventures and connects people and builds a small community. She has a master's degree in media studies um, at, and English studies at the University of Cologne in Germany. And she's got a bachelor's degree in media studies um, at, also at the uh, University of Cologne in Germany. She's also done an internship at the University of Cologne New York office in science diplomacy and public relations and higher education with a um, specific focus on transatlantic trans partnerships between Germany and North American landscape. All right. So whenever you want to take it away, um, the floor is yours, and we're all super excited to hear about tourism yes. and video games. Thank you, Alyssa, for the really nice and detailed introduction. I don't have to say much anymore. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for letting me be here today. I'm uh, very excited to do this because this is, um, I would say, you know, uh, a different audience than, than usual uh, where I present my research, as, um, as you might have already heard, uh, very much from the humanities, um, though, again, I think uh, interdisciplinary work is quite uh, important to my research as well. So today I'll be talking about tourism in video games. Um, I'll be explaining a little bit more later what I exactly mean with that. Um, for today, I have basically two segments. Um, the first one was, well, the self-introduction is going to be very short because we already had that. Um, and a little primer on uh, what game studies is as a field. Uh, I think um, a lot of people kind of, you know, when they hear video games, it's it's because it's so omnipresent, people have like ideas, but they, as an academic discipline, maybe that's a little bit still um, hard to grasp because it's not necessarily institutionalized. Um, people don't, you know, usually go to, unless they study game design, they usually don't uh, go to university to say, yeah, I'm studying game study. So there's maybe a bit, bit of explanation needed. In the second part for today, I will then talk a little bit more about my um, research, um, rather my uh, PhD topic that I'm working on. Um, and the case studies that I've done so far, just to introduce you how to um, apply some of my uh, ideas that I have about uh, tourism in video games and how that plays into specific games. Um, once again, hello. Uh, I have a couple names um, just to clarify this. So my of, my Vietnamese name is Antu, but you can also call me uh, Kathy or Katie. That's how I go in like online spaces and, and in more informal settings. That's totally fine. You can choose whichever name you would like to use. Um, but you know, under like publications, this is usually my Vietnamese name. Um, so currently I'm in Japan um, in my first year. Uh, I arrived one year ago, but I started my PhD research 
half a year ago. That being said, that means that a lot of, you know, my research is uh, a work in progress. And, but that's also why I would love to hear from, you know, people from different disciplines, what kind of ideas that they have or how maybe what I say could align with what they work on. So I would also really love to hear from anyone who, uh, you know, is interested in this topic. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, let's start with a brief primer on what game studies are. Um, like I said, uh, game studies is a relatively young field. Uh, so I think most uh, would say that around the 2000s, that's when game studies as a field really started to try shape its own identity. And um, But because games are so prevalent in our lives, uh, there are so many different points of entry for this field. Uh, we can talk about, uh, especially now, I think now that, that games really have um, established themselves in society, in culture, in arts, there are people who will work, um, for example, in museums, and then they'll test out VR technology in order to preserve um, cities or artifacts. Um, they will use... Uh, games for education. Minecraft is a very popular game uh, to for students, for young students to learn maybe something about electricity circuits. Um, there are people who will, uh, will will study behavioral science with video games. There are others who will uh, who are interested in the simulation aspect of computer games to answer or try to answer questions uh, relating to the climate crisis. Um, to larger than life, um, well, science questions where simulations really help to go through a lot of data at once. And this is really the challenge for game studies. Um, it's, it's having this double challenge of uh, creating its own identity while still staying relevant with so many others. Um, this sometimes leads to you know games being kind of everywhere but then when you say games are everywhere in science then it could also mean that games are nowhere uh, so this is a little bit of a balance that you kind of have to keep when you work with games um, and this is nevertheless um, one of the most defining characteristics is that you can't really define it into just one aspect and i think that's that's the true challenge for game studies and um, I think for me as well, for someone who's uh, from the humanities, in my research, I, I realized that I often drift into different theories, whether that's like game architecture, game design, game marketing, or game, um, like in, use more of the cultural theories to try to understand why we are playing games or why we're so fascinated by it. And um, that really cannot be answered just with, you know, one discipline. And I think no one in game studies uh, really has that claim that only their discipline is relevant to the field. Um, but rather, we are very open to any discipline and any person. Would, um, and you can see that in the video game industry as well. A lot of people will be working on something completely different, maybe a more, you know, hands-on, uh, let's say, uh, AI technology, and then, but then switch over to game development. Um, we have that in academia, where a lot of people will, in, in my case, like, as you saw, uh, I'm a media studies and English studies um, student, but I always kind of pushed my teachers to be like, yeah, but what about video games? Can we do something like that with video games? Whether that was me media theory or literature or um, a lot of those ideas, you can really apply to video games. And um, it's, it's difficult for academia right now to institutionalize game studies because of that. There aren't a lot of um, facilities in the world really explicitly address video games um, and Japan is one of those countries where it seems almost ironic that um, Ritsumeikan where I am is the only university that really has something like a video game research center uh, despite having such a high economic output I think every year they rank maybe second or third in terms of um, the uh, 
annual sales that they achieve through video games. So this, there's like a discrepancy between, you know, the academic research that could be done about video games versus how much video games sell every year and how influential they are in our culture. This is a primer. I don't know if this was helpful because <laughs> um, basically to sum it up, game studies um, is very relevant to, I think any can be relevant to any field because the question should be, why shouldn't it be? Um, it's so prevalent now in almost all the aspects of uh, our lives. Um, especially with, um, and I will talk about that later, games having this ambition that they're not just like, um, they're not just a game, but their whole experiences, they are supposed to encompass a lot of you know, different aspects of our lives and vice versa. A lot of the things that are made for video games can be used in other aspects of our lives as well. With that note, um, can now finally talk a little bit about my uh, research. So um, I got this, uh, you know, this idea about traveling inside video games when I realized that a lot of the games nowadays they have this ambition to be larger than life, basically. Um, and this screenshot from uh, The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt really embodies this, um, this like going up to places and seeking out like a vista, a landscape, something special for the eye um, to look at the mountain, but also to know, okay, I could go there if I wanted to, probably. Uh, that used to be not the case for video games for a long time. Like you, you know, you knew that this is like the background is just um, some kind of, you know, mirage. Um, you see it, but it's not really there. At some point, you're going to hit an invisible wall. But no, games nowadays, they, they try to be more than that. They try to really emulate like a whole world. And this is where the you know simulation aspect comes in. So my work basically is on um, based on the premise that video games are tourist experiences. Um, they, allow to, uh, they allow players to visit places they know from pop culture and media. Players become tourists in land and cityscapes cater towards such tourism. So the, the spaces, they're literally made for this. They're made for the player to be explored. And this is like a unique experience that is different from everyday life. Um, so we have games that even, even games that are not as open world as um, The Witcher 3 is. We have games that, uh, like The Last of Us, um, that can stage really beautiful scenery, uh, but also in conjunction with, you know, the zombie narrative that it has going on for itself, the survival aspect, these really tense moments between very beautiful moments where the characters that we follow have really touching and beautiful moments. And then again, The Witcher 3 having um, an, has an amazing world to explore uh, that seems uh, almost too, too real almost, um, where uh, everything that you see can be explored and that, that you can lose so much time just, you know, exploring. Um, another game that I really like to show as a screenshot is Marvel's Spider-Man. Uh, this was 2000, was it 2018, 17 or something like that? Um, forgot. Um, but this, this really, this screenshot really encompasses like what I mean with tourist experience. Not only do I get to be in New York, uh, I get to be Spider-Man. I get to stand on a high rise building in front of uh, Times Square where usually, you know, it's crowded with, in real life where it's often crowded with tourists. Um, and but here in the game, I can take, uh, not can I not not only can I be my my maybe my favorite comic character, um, but also uh, be at a place that is super iconic and recreate this feeling of like being in New York. Um, I got this idea from uh, mostly uh, John Ery and Jonas Larsen, who wrote the book The Tourist Gaze. Uh, a lot of it, they uh, a lot in, a lot in this book is about how we in our everyday life seek these like unique experiences, and how we and and what constitutes it. They talk a lot about um, the movement you have to do. Um, they emphasize this really, like this this movement from A to B, then having these like experiences that you do while moving. Um, and I think 
the important thing for me in the in that book is the emphasis on the daydreaming and anticipation of new or different experiences that they connect to pop culture necessarily. So these expectations that are built up because we live in such a mediated world where we read books, read comics, read um, watch TV shows, see images of New York, uh, see images of you know places or no places from history books, and now these places become you know basically the theater stage for video games. To talk about gaming as tourist experience, I need to first talk about gaming as just experience first. Um, so I, I got this from Pine and Gilmore, who in 1998 already already spoke of, you know, our, our cultures and our economies, we are becoming more experience-based. Like the products that we buy, they're not like products that we use, I don't know, in the kitchen or something, but um, we buy products that are um, basically using our time for enjoyment. So we want to enjoy something that we buy because we, and, and there's nothing inherently, it doesn't have to be like a physical object. Um, and in early 1998, so this is kind of just before game studies kind of kicked off, they say that uh, there's a, already a whole new genre of experiences such as interactive games. And they already had, you know, I think in their updated book uh, a couple of years later, they spit very explicitly say this is they meant video games with it and um they already you know had an eye a little bit on that for sure but i i, I think it's a bit of an understatement understatement to say that uh maybe they, they were kind of like just mentioning it on the side they think they they were really pretty much right uh uh hit the head on the nail um with that one um and so gaming is definitely part of this like experience economy. We have uh, games that this is all that games are. They really want to give you a good time. And we can see that with how games are uh, marketed nowadays, um, the, the way that you know, the words that they use to uh, advertise their games. And this is uh, from Ubisoft, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. In this game, you uh, this is set in um, ancient uh, Greece, and you play. Uh, I, I mean, the, the the text here really says it. I'm gonna read some of uh, my favorite, like with emphasis on some special words. Um, embark on an epic journey that takes you from your humble beginnings as an outcast Spartan mercenary to a legendary Greek hero, and uncover the truth about your mysterious past as Alexios or Cassandra. Sail to the farthest reaches of the Aegean Sea. For, uh, forming alliances and making enemies. Along the way, you'll encounter historical figures, mythical characters, and a whole cast of others who will impact your journey. So I think here again, there's emphasis on this movement, be somewhere that where you're usually not. Um, the, the idea of uncovering legends uh, this, or facing myths or facing enemies. Um, so this is clearly like an experience that is different from our everyday life, but it is also fed with you know, our expectation, expectations about what um, ancient Greece was like, um, because this is, they're trying to sell you the idea of being a Spartan, uh, essentially. And uh, I think this is the appeal for a lot of these Assassin's, Assassin's Creed uh, games is that they're usually set in specific periods of history. So for all the you know, history nerds, or if you really just like a specific period in history this is like a game that might appeal to you in order to have that kind of experience um in the last two years is there's another example i love to bring up is um animal crossing new horizons uh, so this is a game where you usually are put on a place like in this case it's an island where you are given a house and you have to build it slowly and then you have people who live in your village and you kind of design your village um, well that's basically the premise of the game and uh so two years ago when the pandemic just started um for nintendo this i think animal crossing new horizons was slated to be released on march 20th and this is uh this coinc coincided with a lot of the lockdown beginnings basically uh all across the world so not only did in this year and in that quarter i think all the sales from so 
PlayStation 4 and Xbox One at the time, they were had 25% higher sales than com compared to the same time the year before. For the Nintendo Switch, it was double, whereas Animal Crossing really sped that up, that process of like, you know, a lot of Switches were just simply sold out because Animal Crossing came out at the same time and people were in lockdown. People could not have experiences that they usually have uh, throughout their everyday life that really requires like physical movement to go to a museum, to go to the cinema. And a lot of people were looking for an outlet. And I think video games gave a lot of people this outlet. It is debatable whether video games can truly replace it. Probably not. But they can definitely offer um, some kind of experience that elevated, you know, those feelings of being in a, you know, confined in a physical space. Because Animal Crossing allowed you to be on an island with friends uh, if you had the multiplier function. Uh, it allowed you to be social yet be distancing yourself from each other physically to be safe and uh, video games played a big role in that year to um you know for people to seek out experiences that were uh you know elevating their feelings of maybe loneliness to return as you know the concept of gaming as tourist experiences here i have in the next like few slides um i have a quote from you know more like cultural theory so usually it's um from the tourist gaze book that i talked about earlier and the bottom we have uh quotes from early game studies scholarship and even though I talked about how video game studies need to be interdisciplinary, often what happens is that um, because in the early 2000s, game studies tried so hard to be, you know, we are our own field, we are we are independent and we are, you know, we definitely have our, our own identity. What happens is that there was a lot of writing on concepts like interactivity and immersion that have existed in similar ways before, but there seems to be like a disconnect between like, in like in academic discourse there there seems to be like as if the same thing has been written before but no one really makes the bridge between them and so i think there's like a lot of um disconnected potential that needs to be connected and uh, so that's one of my um research aims in my phd is to really like bridge that and here we have already talked about in the first quote um the 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 concept of what a tourist relationship uh, constitutes as this kind of movement, the expectation of pop culture. And Britta Neitzel in, 20, um, in her book from 2018, but I think this is a text that was released a little bit earlier, um, she, while describing what involvement means, uh, she um, describes that a user develops a sensitivity towards being transported into a virtual space or rather as if the space itself has transported to its user so to a certain extent she's describing a kind of spatial movement or a player movement and this is very similar to what um john Ari and jonas larsen describe in the book on the tourist case and what constitutes as, as tourist relationships um they so John Ari and Jonas Larsen also had this like big emphasis on pop culture because our world is so mediated. We have different technologies to um, consume uh, images. And uh, Gordon Calleja in 2011, uh, he wrote that the places we yearn for the most are um, are those that are different from our everyday surroundings, especially as promoted and popularized by the media. And this is was about like what immersion is. So why why do we immerse ourselves in, into game worlds? And again, to me, that is really the same thing. Like th these two um, passages, they describe the same thing, but there is a clear disconnect between these two fields. Um, in my master's thesis, I wrote about theme parks and Disney and Kingdom Hearts, and um, a lot of that was you know the emphasis on spatial architecture. So how do we design a space that is convincing to the player where the player can move or is guided by the spatial layout? And Scott Lucas then said that um, for a space to become a theme park, uh, no, for, for a theme park to uh, become more than just an amusement park, it needs an architecture of persuasion. And 
uh, he was referring to Disney and how Disney was telling stories through its space, telling, uh, really making a player feel the space. You know, it's it's like when you go into you know the Star Wars section of um, of Disney World, it's it's not just you know it's it's people in costumes, it's the amazing set that seems as if you know it's it's bigger than it really is because it plays with a lot of um, optical illusions. Um, and this architecture of persuasion is really something that games really try to do. I mean, if we think about it, this the space in video games, it doesn't technically exist. And we all know that when we sit in front of a PC, um, we know that the space isn't real, but it seems so real to us because the simulation of it is so real that of course we, you know, we, we navigate within it as if it was real. Um, and then Stefan Günzel wrote that in comparison but while comparing it to ego shooters that they do ex exactly this they allow for a spatial constitution whose structure is perceived as real despite only existing within its medium or rather insisting on itself so the video game is over the video games always point to themselves as being like hey i am i'm really real like because my space it just feels so real um and you move within that space thinking or assuming that you can rely on these like simulations To uh, trying to visualize <clears throat> my own research um, and the things that I am like considering or that I am um, that I need to know. Basically, um, I have different fields that I want to look at, and they can be kind of divided like this, but not really. Uh, it's probably more of a mix between everything. Like game studies is probably also in cultural industry and experiences and cultural theory is also a lot in space and travel. Um, so this is what my research basically kind of looks like currently. And um, I am uh, very much digging into the you know respective theories. Sometimes they don't explicitly mention games. Sometimes they very do already explicitly mention games because for example, space, um, so the, like game spaces have been explored quite well uh, in 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 video game studies, um, and also you know how to critically think about games as um, a product of our culture industry, uh, a product of you know capitalism, a product of uh, you know our current experience economy, um, and there are so many other things that you know go into it. So. There's stuff like game photography that I already, you know, talked about um, a little bit with Spider-Man, but I'll talk about it again uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, to conceptualize game architecture, to conceptualize players, travelers. Um, from my MA, I took a lot of knowledge about, like, you know, the strategies that are required to build a space or, like, a digital space. And... Um, other terms that I've, for example, worked with before is um, stage atmospheres, um, where I talk a little bit about how, even though atmospheres is such a you know vague concept, that this is being used in order uh, in in video games in order to stage these experiences. And currently, I am looking at the uh, at the relationship between travel and tourism because I realized that. Uh, a lot of the literature that I read at some point, especially older literature, will talk about uh, traveling and the traveler. But in more recent, so like in the tourist case, obviously, um, John Nery and Jonas Larsen usually talk about the tourist. So I wanted to know what exactly changed? When did the traveler become a tourist? And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, um, our industrial changes to mass tourism, access to transportation, access, um, access to public transportation especially. And this is important for uh, my research because I think that a lot of the practices that the player um, really conducts inside a game are probably not either or traveler or tourist, but a mode between these two. Uh, when we have game photography, for example, I do think that just comes more in, uh, that might be more aligned with tourism than it is just with simply traveling. But this is something that I will have to look into further. Uh, this is um, that this was spurned on by um, 
I read a book about how traveling within Japan was sanctioned for a long time. So peasants were not allowed to uh, travel for a long time. They had to receive permissions, usually from um, the upper class and the historical documents that would um, describe any kind of traveling at all would be from very powerful uh, feudal lords, um, from families who were able to afford traveling in the first place. And I think there's something about, you know, there must be a connection between travel literature. So uh, early travel literature that we know in, in, in the West uh, about, you know, people traveling to Asia, coming back and then describing uh, the beautiful, wonderful sites that they have seen. And uh, I think there is something to be said about that in connection with video games and how we travel inside these spaces. But that is uh, a work in progress. <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I am in Japan is uh, one of the things that I really want to look at in, in terms of case studies is um, the increased well, increased appearances of, you know, Japanese aesthetics in media, especially video games. Uh, what I mean with that is that um, cultural references to Japan, whether it's through characters or its narrative world, have become increasingly popular. Um, they reference Japan usually, you know, in, uh, in the story or they usually show a brief shot of something that kind of looks like Tokyo. Um, evokes the idea of Japan for some reason. And I was very interested in why that is, uh, why that's so popular to just name some uh, some examples. Um, we have, um, so these are, I think all of them um, produced in America. Yes, in the US. Uh, so we have Westworld where in season two, the whole premise of the show is they have a theme park, which is already, you know, perfect for what my, my interests are. Um, they have a theme park and in season two, uh, they introduced this new part of the theme park that's usually like Western, but now they have like samurai area. And um, and I, I thought that was interesting because also old samurai films were often based on old Western films or rather they were influencing each other uh, at the time really heavily. So we already have like the like media connection, but also the, you know, the emphasis on having Japanese dresses, people speaking Japanese. And um, that was very, very obvious in the second season of Westworld. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about the others, but my favorite is probably here, Big Hero 6, the Pixar animated film where the whole city where it takes place is literally a mixture of San Francisco and Tokyo, which is why the city is called San Francisco. Uh, so the whole space is like, you see very obvious Japanese elements, but also very obvious, you know, San Francisco elements. And this is where they set it. And it, it, it visually it's, it's beautiful. And I think um, why it's so beautiful is one of the reasons why that I try to answer um, in my research. Uh, as far as video games are concerned, uh, one popular example is in Overwatch, um, the characters of uh, Genji and Hanzo, who were um, featured in an animated short film and really blew, you know, the uh, at the time uh, really blew the popularity of Overwatch uh, because the short film was regarded as one of the best that Blizzard had created at the time and made people really play these characters so people because they watched this they started playing these two characters and they were i think for a long time the most played heroes in uh, in the game i often see um in video games i often see this area so this is a stock image of the red light district in shinjuku in tokyo and this is a place for example that gets um remediated a lot in uh, in media so we have um we have uh, persona 5 where uh you spend a lot of time in the red light district in the night then there's also the um yakuza game or the yakuza series um with the red light district um and i'm i'm interested in how really they make these places and how they uh end up you know deciding um, how, what can we use of this space to make it look significant? Because like when you, even in the Yakuza series, I think they don't call it 
the red light district, but like they have like an abbreviated name. It's very clear it's supposed to be the red light district, but they, I think for legal reasons or something like that, they cannot like use the exact same name. But it's very clear it's supposed to be that. Um, and I think no one will question that it, it is um, it is the red light district. And so the makeup of this space is something that really interests me uh, in my research. And um, the same goes for uh, Ghost of Tsushima, um, where I wrote a case study uh, about, um, you know, what what, what makes um, the game so attractive and um, so successful to a lot of the Western players. It appeals to a lot of the, you know, the cliches that we have about Japan, about the seasons, about flowers, about uh, traversing to, you know, shrines and temples. The game um, really makes the player go out of the way to look for places that seem abandoned um, to enjoy the surroundings. And this is a very nature focused game. So we have no cityscapes, but rather just landscapes. Um, and the samurai genre in itself is already interesting because the game uh, put so much emphasis on the samurai films, uh, by, especially by Akira Kurosawa. And uh, they the video game producers and designers, they specifically said that they were inspired by Akira Kurosawa, but also by Star Wars. And Star Wars, you know, also in return was, you know, influenced by samurai films because of the lightsaber. You could also easily replace it with a katana sword. And I think we would all be still doing the same thing. Um, and so there's something to be said about how these figures of you know samurai characters persist in our you know western perception of japan um and how this co is combined with our expectations of media the game uh, had very beautiful uh, game photography options um i think one at the time one of the most sophisticated ones uh, you were able to change the time change the weather change whether you wanted to have green leaves flying through the screen or red leaves flying through the screen so and also change facial expressions um so game photography has been around for quite a long time but often well let's say maybe 20 years ago let's say it, it wasn't like an inbuilt function i think only few games truly you know had the option of a camera so to speak um for the player to use in order to capture pictures that they could save on their computers or on their other on their hardware um for one early playstations or other hardware uh, consoles didn't have this option and there was no point like you couldn't um necessarily take a screenshot and share it on uh on like an online platform because most of them didn't have that function mm. whereas players on pc they could you know circumvent that because the the computer itself had the functions of taking screenshots and then this would be uploaded but of course people would also just take you know uh pictures of their screens and upload this to uh up upload this online so there are many ways of doing game photography but what's really changed is it's becoming a game mechanic it's really embedded into the game and i think a lot of like these games like ghost of tsushima so i'm talking about the high production the triple a games the the you know the blockbuster games it is expected that you can that this well that the game has this function that you can take photographs of places that Places are there to be savored and to be taken a picture of. And sometimes you get achievements for doing so. Or sometimes the game will even send you on quests to do so, even though maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with the story. So Ghost of Tsushima really plays on its visual, um, well, not authenticity, but, you know, visual atmospheres, visual appeal. Uh, I, I don't know how many here have played it or... Um, have seen what it was like on social media shortly after this game was released. For a long time, there were people who were just simply posting pictures of their own travels. Uh, so people were like, look at me, I'm um, petting a fox. You, you can do this in this game. Um, and have beautiful scenery. Or I finally managed to get onto the peak of this mountain and have this beautiful view. So people, a lot of my social media became like a picture book for maybe a week or two. And I think that that's really like saying something about, 
you know, not just game photography, but how we travel inside digital spaces now. Um, the summary game, I think, is like, well, Ghost of Tsushima in so far is also interesting because after this, it kind of kicked off, you know, some other Asian, Japan inspired games that are uh, developed by other countries that are not Japan. Um, so I think this um, game that also, again, plays with the cinematic qualities, um, cinematic appeal of samurai films uh, was developed by, I think, Tractor Yomi uh, was developed by a Polish game studio. And they um, it's it's basically just like this the entire time. So unlike Ghost of Tsushima, it doesn't really change perspective. So it's always like this on the side and you can only move left or right. So like a 2D scroller, but obviously the graphics, um, you know, try to be like an Akira Kurosawa film. And I think, um, again, this speaks to the unique experiences that we seek from our everyday life um, that are so heavily influenced by media. In my other um, case study, I uh, wrote about Cyberpunk 2077, and this is mostly, this was mostly because uh, I was discussing the term techno-orientalism. So Cyberpunk has been around for a long time, right? So since the 80s or something. Um, and in, you know, Western American landscapes, we usually uh, think of, you know, Blade Runner and then the, a lot of the influences at the time um, were from you know Japan because Japan at the time was an economic powerhouse, but we also had you know Hong Kong cinema dominating the screens, and a lot of that was a lot of those like East Asian influences became uh, influential to the cyberpunk genre. And uh, in the eighties, people were especially writing about cyberpunk and its relation to you know Asian references uh, because of a fear um, because Japan was so influential economically, culturally, they were producing technology that uh, was widely used by everyone like Walkmans and um, other CD players or cars manufacturing. This was at the time um, a real anxiety that, you know, was also reflected in the cyberpunk genre. And cyberpunk as a genre I like so much because it is a little bit more honest about its, you know, it's it's not honest, but let's say self-reflective about its you know political and cultural issues at the, it, that it has to grapple with at its time, and um, in in usually in cyberpunk, um, that you know this like influence of Japan and East Asia in general was more of a you know of a, of a negative trade, and in the case study that I did, I looked at cyberpunk and kind of say well while well, that might be still kind of true to a certain extent that, you know, we look at Asia as like this, wow, this this somewhat, you know, distant wonderland. So a little bit of a fetishization. Um, it is not entirely true that, um, it is not entirely true anymore that this is because there's some sense of being afraid of being, you know, being taken over by Japan. I don't think that's true anymore. Um, and I think in Cyberpunk 2077, it's great. Um, it's, it is reflected in a way that oh, Japan has become this hub of entertainment and of tourism. And I really like this one. I hope this works. I really like this screenshot so much because as you can see here, there are two uh, non-playable characters uh, in front of this shrine which is already you know the shrine itself is already kind of a, a a strange place because um cyberpunk 2077 is supposed to be placed in uh place uh, in north america in on the west coast and so there's no reason for a shrine to be there really uh, there's no historical you know background and i i tried to figure, find out more details about the shrine but the deities that are supposed to be honored there are also kind of strange like some date here about electricity or something like that um and uh, so it has no like real historical background but that's not the point um the point is that it's there for people to look at and the cyberpunk game has these two characters in front of it that really you know set the tone for this specific place it is a place where people take selfies and take other photographs they they're there to 
look at it and not necessarily because they have like some kind of spiritual connection to it um that, that's not the point uh, and when you go inside you kind of like there's some kind of social commentary going on where i'm not exactly sure yet like what the what like the final line is uh, i don't think there is one but when you go inside you can hear um as other visitors saying something like uh that they're bored or that they uh or they, they kind of like harass the priests who you know doesn't really do anything to do something uh so that they can take videos of it so it's a little bit you know commenting on um how tourism kind of like ruins places maybe um over tourism maybe um so this is uh this this is this is an interesting one um this is something that i have to look further the case study that i did write i think was very brief i would like to revisit this again for sure um and write about this in more detail um but what is important for these games is that they they appeal to you in a way that you, you cannot inherently describe as a player like immediately like what is it that seems so beautiful about them aside from maybe the quality of the graphics i, I think quality of graphics isn't a good indicator either to describe like an atmosphere of a game or how convincing something is otherwise a lot of the games in our childhood wouldn't have worked out as well as they did um and one of the one of the concepts that i worked with was to uh, describe them as stage atmospheres so this allows us to describe well, this allowed me to describe the place as something that uh that are from feeling wise very vague um, but they are staged because in the end they are products. Um, there are designers and architects out there, not just for games, but for you know, for real places that really try to capture a specific mood, a specific atmosphere that is so vague when the when the when the person themselves uh, themselves go inside there uh, that cannot be grasped really into words. But it has to be made somehow, right? And what kind of strategies go behind it? Um, like the strategies that go uh, into it and uh, to to create this is um, why it's like a stage place. And when in in the marketing for Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, this was one of the most I would say like the essential marketing strategy that they had to try to sell you this place. So Night City is where uh, is how the city is called, and they were really really trying to sell to the audience that. This is a place where you want to be. It's exciting. It's different uh, from you know your everyday life, but it's cyberpunk, and everyone kind of knows what cyberpunk is. Uh, and we have it for you. We made it. This is. I think that was like their sales pitch. Um, I think uh, my some of you might have followed like the initial release of the game. It was not so well received as they tried to sell it. Um, though I think now it probably is in a better state than it was at the time of its release. Nevertheless, we can see how much game producers and game designers are trying to make places the sales pitch. And it's not really about the story anymore. It's not about, you know, sometimes it's not even about the characters. Um, sometimes the characters will sell to help, uh, will help to sell uh, these places, but it's really like, the kind of feeling that oh, I want to be in the cyberpunk world. And I think the cyberpunk genre is special in so far that it is a genre that is inherently made out of these pop cultural expectations. Whereas Assassin's Creed, we have kind of, of course, they are, there are pop cultural expectations, but they're mostly like based on some kind of historical knowledge. We don't have really have that with cyberpunk. We have that with, uh, we have films and references to cyberpunk we have um you know literature on cyberpunk where we feel like okay this is this is what gives us an idea about what cyberpunk is supposed to be and um it's i think it's hard to capture like the essence of this and as an another example this is an indie game um called cloudpunk uh, and it's in the voxel graphics so when you if you look a little bit closer like if if you look up the game like some gameplay after this maybe you see that it's all like small blocks um and at first glance this doesn't look like that at all because they have a real like they have a big emphasis on the lighting there's rain usually this game always plays in the night so this this helps already to establish like the cloud punk environment 
and it's it's in so far interesting to see when an indie game usually only has you know two or three essential game mechanics so what do they focus on what do they what do they do to create this environment that even though by comparison to like a triple a game like cyberpunk when you only have few options limited budget and limited design possibilities and this is not an open world game what do you do with it and this game i think and i'm not advertising it i genuinely believe that it's a good game to exemplify what happens when you're only left with like limited um, possibilities where an experience is not just like you can do everything here but you can do only a few things here but the things that you can do work really well and this is in this game you play as a delivery driver and th that's it you move from a to b and then you talk to people and the whole experience is because you get to drive a car a flying car in the city and uh, i think this really boils down to this you know what can what can we make as a as a game experience that would sell well and i think Cloudpunk really does it well so cyberpunk as a genre is still really really relevant and this is like something that i definitely want to visit um recently there was um a new anime that was released uh well new, not new but cd project red the creators of uh, cyberpunk 2077 uh, collaborated with Studio Trigger, a Japanese uh, animation studio, in order to create Cyberpunk Edge Runners. And what happened was, um, when I think the anime came out on the 13th of September, uh, you can see in September the the player count uh, went up by 315 percent. So there was a very strong increase in player interest in cyberpunk because the anime gave them the idea of what it's like to be in the city they grew attached to the storyline and because they couldn't get enough of what the 12 episodes or something had they went into the game to um experience this further and ever since then ever since the release of uh the anime the the player count has been i think steady just staying on the same average level that isn't higher than before and that really speaks to its success um and uh even though the cyberpunk genre has changed a lot in the last years and there's no and techno orientalism so the the way we see japan has changed a lot i think um cyberpunk as a genre is more relevant than ever before especially to my research when it comes to what kind of expectations we have to you know places and spaces yeah and um now we have reached the end of my presentation uh, i hope that was engaging informative um fun uh, or interesting uh, let me know what you think in, in the q a yeah that was awesome oh it was so cool um yeah thank you so much for sharing all of that really great all those really great insights and all of your amazing research um i think everybody really enjoyed it because there are so many questions in the slide oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay so we'll, so we'll get to those um but first i needed to ask you a question um for the screenshots they're absolutely gorgeous um, yes. did you take them yourself most of them i think 80 percent of them i took them myself yes wow and that's amazing that's that's also you know the, the fact that you can't tell i think is already quite telling <laughs> like which ones are you know taken by me or like some like maybe something that i've taken off the internet yeah 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 because it definitely looks like um i don't know they're just so picturesque of like yes you know exactly this is it's like it's like this would be something that they released for advertising or something it's yes gorgeous. yes oh, so neat yeah, so um, I'm really curious about um, like what where are you going to take your research next? Like, what are your next steps for for research, and what do you hope to gain out of the rest of your um, yeah? I guess like PhD program. Yeah, uh, so like I said, uh, this already only started like over half a year ago, and my real goal is to be able to speak to game designers. I think the way like since I talk so much about how things are designed i really think it's essential for me to um speak to game designers and uh so i hope by next year that i've i will be able to you know get some contacts and i might not be able to you know get 
into get in touch with you know bigger companies so because like some of the games i've talked about here they're really big like the blockbuster i, I always say you know the marvel films of the video game industry so it might not be possible for them to reveal their secrets to me but um smaller games indie games i feel like might be a bit more welcoming to someone like me contacting them and uh, sharing a little bit of you know their expertise so uh, i hope i can make that happen especially for one of the you know cyberpunk themed games that's for sure yeah nice that sounds really exciting i can't wait to hear hear what the results are and hear about how those conversations go yes later. i just hope it works out well <laughs> <laughs> of course all right, well, I will go ahead and start diving into the Slido questions here. Um, yes. I want to make sure that we're able to cover them. Um, okay, so the first one, do you think that digital tourism will remain focused when it's acknowledged on imagined locations, historical locations, or real world locations? Um, that was one of me. Um, I think in the very beginning, I had a slide uh, where it's going to take me a bit, but I mean, let me just, I think it's worth visiting that one. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so I wrote an article before, like a, um, for an um, online uh, website where I looked a little bit um, at a game called The Bus. And the, the, the premise of this game was, uh, well, it's a, it's a bus simulation game, and they wanted to have Berlin on a scale of one to one. And so that premise sounds really exciting, right? Um, but I feel the, 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 the game experience itself, however, was a little bit lackluster because um, they didn't really, even though they tried to have this premise of, you know, we're going to make Berlin one to one in our video game, it didn't quite work um, because there were so many essential things missing um, and so many things that were, you know, not working well. Uh, as an example, I can give you throughout my own gameplay. One time, you know, when you go into supposedly more crowded areas, so when you leave the bus and then you go in front of a cafe, um, you hear like sounds of people talking and then like probably a waiter carrying dishes. You, you hear the clearing of the, you know, the, uh, all the cutlery and stuff, but there's no one there. The, the, there's just absolutely no one. So there's a dis there was a disconnect in the audiovisual design and the what, what I what I really saw. And even though it looks beautiful in this screenshot, it became very like the 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 faults of this game became obvious very quickly. Um, nevertheless, you know people play this game for other reasons than you know I don't know special authenticity I guess. I think the the hard challenge with it's not impossible, but the hard challenge with real places is um, once you have this premise of doing something one to one, you are not just um, you kind of lose this flavor of your own interpretation that is usually from the game designer. You know, like what makes a space attractive, what makes something. Uh, I want to like revisit again. And I think while it's not impossible to make a one-to-one -one place that is exciting for the player, I think that's definitely more, a harder challenge than um, places that we can like kind of craft from popular imaginations. I hope that kind of answers your question. That's at least my opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to find that balance, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so what forms of digital tourism will VR, AR, and XR take? And which do you think will see actual uptake? Mm, I think there's great potential for museums to uh, use this as a place of education and as a place of um, exploration when uh, made accessible to people who cannot literally be in those physical spaces. Uh, I think there were projects in Europe and I, I don't I haven't been able to keep up with them and I don't know what happened to them, but I know that there was a project that was supposed to um, preserve um, a cultural uh, site that was destroyed, I believe in Syria because of bombings. Um, and this is 
I think an amazing chance for uh, you know for educators, for game designers, for uh, researchers um, to really make use of this um, like of this perspective to be to say that mm, games can be you know this this bodily experience, this movement experience of seeing and learning, um, and I think that that is a incredible potential so i'm very interested what will happen to museums especially to make you know education more accessible to even places that we have no longer access to um as a, as a different example assassin's creed uh, i think with odyssey they also had this discovery was it called i think discovery tour um it was independent from the game uh, a game mode that you could play but you just walk through greece and then you meet philosophers um like historical figures and then they would explain stuff to you and i think that was very that was very well done even though personally i'm not a really big fan of the assassin's creed series but i thought the discovery tour was was again using games as um to be like an educational potential yeah 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 that makes sense actually i think i saw on amazon one time um you can purchase like a uh, digital tour where <laughs> you oh. pay some amount of money and then somebody will go out with a selfie stick to a location and <laughs> <laughs> show you around <laughs> that's sweet i mean that totally makes sense because you know like i said not everyone can be at places sometimes i mean because of the pandemic i think we all know that um and Opportunities like that would make, you know, tour tourism, so to say, more accessible. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, here's another question. How do you think we can convey in video games that ethereal feeling of being in a place from books, um, from books and port that into video games? Like the, the feeling of being in a place? I guess like, uh, like the, I guess like the feeling of being, um, like from books, I think like some, like some books when you read, they have like this feeling of like, Being, sort yeah. Of, yeah, very ethereal, very kind of like sometimes mystical, sometimes yeah. very like, mm, I don't know. I think um, spatial theory, so the, you know, the the way we think about space, it's definitely not something that came only with, you know, uh, visual media, uh, but visual media, you know, um, you don't need words to describe a space, if that makes sense. Whereas in literature, I think, there's um, um let me let me start again um we had like in early uh, video games um before we had any kind of visual indicators there were text based games right text based games would uh kind of do the same as literature in a sense that they would describe a space to you and you would have to you know decide to go left or right so they gave you options that that was the you know the game part of it but i think literature for you know, thousands of years has always been able to give us the idea of a specific place, uh, even when it's completely fictional. So science fiction literature is um, is really um, obsessed with that idea, actually. Um, I, ever, I wrote an article before about the concept of mind spaces. And even though I talk about the concept of mind spaces in a different sense, the first people to use that um, concept were science fiction writers who said that well science fiction is a way of projecting our own mind onto like a landscape and then that we turn into words and literature and i think the way we translate this into literature is definitely different um in comparison to games um because i i i think games are very unique in that sense because every medium is unique and um, so films do it differently video games do it differently and uh the way we translate that i think is a challenge to the designers as well yeah yeah for sure and and, the, and then the, the converse of that is there's another question that asks pretty much the opposite is um how do you like as a in game design how do you take care such that um like a reality is not too fictional. Like when when does the game cross that border where it's like, oh, all of a sudden it's like it's like too fictional and we want to preserve the reality. Like how do you, I don't know, like how do games know where to strike that balance? That's a good question. I wonder if I have an answer to that. Um I think the 
ambition to be realistic is already quite an ambition in it, on its own. Um, it's because because even in our like own world, I feel sometimes things happen that are not very realistic, right? And um, how do you make how do you keep that? how do you still make that believable in video games is, is a is a different question altogether i think for video games there's always some kind of suspension of um you know disbelief at play so um you always kind of have to accept the fact for example in assassin's creed that you can go up real close to someone and then stab them from behind with just one knife um i mean that and they won't make a sound because you approach them from behind so these are like rules of play that are already you know in the minds of players i think there are you know in some games you do not take fall damage you accept it as the reality within that game um and i i wonder if um if there's ever i'm, I'm trying to think of a game where i feel like oh this is like oh this is like too much or this makes no sense um but usually that is if if i ever have that feeling it is because i feel like the game design is not fluid and not because they are like crossing the boundaries of maybe it becoming too fantastical if that makes sense yeah 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 that makes sense like as long as they're consistent with their own rules of whatever reality yes. that they have then that's yes. fine but as soon as they start breaking their own rules like and not within the story exactly. it's kind of like what are you doing if, if there's a specific point or like purpose for it um in in a game uh life is strange there's some at some point like a, a dream sequence and then things get really wonky but then you realize it's a dream sequence and then it makes sense uh, because then the game itself you know bends its own rules and that's when you kind of tell something is wrong so when games do that they do it on purpose often mm -hmm. they're not yeah yeah that makes sense. Um, so another question is, uh, first off, thank you for the great talk. Um, and is there some balance between playing a game and exploring it freely that makes it uh, that help makes it a deeper, more enjoyable or therapeutic experience? Um, so the question was about like the boundaries of a game, like the game world. Yeah, like uh, if you have like, is there a balance between playing the game and exploring it freely? Um, mm. Yeah, and then um, like, how oh, is that okay, balance okay. making it? Yeah, um, that really, I think that is like, uh, that really depends on the player type, right? Uh, this is, um, there are people out there who will not play whatever that game is telling them to do, but they will do anything else but that. Um, they will go out of their way. Um, and we also have like a, a little bit of in game studies. We also have you know scholarship on players who purposefully disobey the game rules so they will go out of their way to find bugs and glitches or they will use glitches in order to uh exploit the game for their own purposes this is for example very popular in uh, speed running games um so the challenge of trying to finish a game as quickly as possible uh is often only achieved by exploiting glitches that are unintentional by the game designers so that is when the players really um you know, we often in media studies, especially, we like to equate viewers or players as like, you know, they don't think on their own. They just follow the space layout that's given to them. They don't really think about, you know, beyond the box. But no, there is a lot of play that challenges these, you know, conceptions. So and speed running and using glitches is one of them. And uh, I think depending on what kind of player you are, you may find it more enjoyable to just not do anything that the game tells you to do, but go off on some side quest that is maybe not even that rewarding, but for you it's rewarding. I think that's also the beauty of games that you can have such an individual experience. Um, so that that is something um, I often talk about games as if there, there's only one way to play it, because you know I look at single player games and they're often designed to be you know played like this but i think even um slowly games themselves because they become so open world or like so full of possibilities the idea is to and that obviously doesn't come with you know drawbacks in terms of labor um but the idea is maybe you design a, a game that's so big but the player might only see like 15 percent of it but that's fine because they can play however they want mm. yeah that makes a lot of sense for sure um 
Okay, so another question. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the best games um, that focus on tourism, tourism are single player games. Um, and do you think shared experiences could do better? Um, and I also, I'm also thinking about like reading that question, it makes me think about like um, Skyrim was such an immersive game as tourism. Um, and then they did Elder Scrolls Online. And it at first it had a lot of negative reviews because having other players in the world sort of like ruined that experience for a lot of people. Um, so that so that's my part of the question, but how do you how do you see that? Um, so I know that for MMOs, uh, a lot of the MMOs nowadays, they, they have something like a sightseeing log. Um, I'm thinking right now of about Final Fantasy XIV, where you kind of do that uh, for achievements most of the time. So there's a specific purpose behind it. Um, so that's that's one way to explain, you know, there are game mechanics to support a kind of tourism. On the other hand, I can also understand people who say, you know, Maybe people do it just for the achievements. They don't necessarily do it because they want to be, you know, you, you, they feel immersed in a space. I would not say that it's impossible for MMOs to have, give that feeling because um, one of the quotes that I used uh, when I think the one by Gordon Calleja, um, oh, let me see. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, the places we yearn, yearn for the most are those that are different from our everyday surroundings, especially as promoted and popularized by the media. He was actually talking about World of Warcraft in this section, and he was uh, writing about like a hill that he would always go on to just simply relax. Like that's that's, and he would have like an overview over the world behind this hill. Um, so it is definitely uh, not like a. I would say yes, single player games have a stronger emphasis on it because MMOs usually have this like community playing together kind of aspect to it or the story. Uh, so it's just a, a question of priority, but uh, for the game designers, but I wouldn't say it's impossible because I also personally, I have spots in Final Fantasy 14 that I really enjoy going to and just being there. And um, I, I wonder though if it, I think the question for me then that I don't have an answer for right now that as, as I'm talking, this came up in my mind. I wonder if it's because MMOs kind of represent a kind of um, alternative home, like a, a place of feeling you know, home where you know your community, where you know the players and where you already know the areas versus, you know, single player games that where you usually, like, like I said, there are different types of players, but where you usually play them one time and then that's it. So that's like a specifically unique experience in that moment, whereas MMOs, I think you kind of go back to them. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have a few more questions too. Yes. All right, um, so in Japan, have you noticed or studied how players at games like Go slash Shoji arguably show a more zen or explorative, less competitive attitude than Western games? Oh, that's a good question that uh, I will be honest with you, I have not looked into. Um, so uh, my own player experience with the, with, the, with the Japanese community is with online competitive games. So I play Apex Legends privately. I don't write anything about it, <laughs> um, but um, I play it. And uh, I don't have never really experienced a Zen kind of uh, attitude towards like towards Apex Legends. In fact, it seems like maybe because the Apex Legends players here in Japan are very young, um, there, there definitely is like a very heavy competitive spirit here when it comes to Apex Legends. So this is not something I have observed personally, but that that doesn't come from like any basis on on, on research. So I would love to hear more about um, board games, to be honest. Yeah, yeah interesting. See, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, and then the, and then here's a question. Um, so what do you think is missing? Or what do you what do you think is successful or not successful in procedural content for tourism, relative to handcrafted locations? So um, this question brings to mind like those um, space exploration games where there's planets yeah. yes. like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, what was, um, oh yeah, right. No Man's Sky, that was the game, right? Uh, where uh -huh. it was about where the whole 
sales pitch was about you know the infinite uh exploration and i think there's the next uh I forgot the name, but the next big space exploration game by the makers of Fallout it was also um, it's someone in the chat probably knows it, but I think um, th there's a new game announced that basically also has the same sales pitch that you have you will be able to visit thousands of planets, but um, I think the when we think back of No Man's Sky and how people reacted to this premise, people were really excited about No Man's Sky. And then obviously it didn't, upon release, players' expectations were not fulfilled. They were in fact very disappointed, even though the game now is in a, in a, in a better state than ever before. But when the new game by the Fallout makers made the same sales pitch, people were a bit worried, I think, in the game industry. They were like, oh, we had this before and if you promise us thousands of planets, we know that they're not going to be, that, that that's going to be procedural and that's not going to be, maybe we'll see like the same elements kind of happening in, in other planets just with like minor um, changes. I think that's, at currently that's the that's like the, 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 the fear that people have. This is not to say procedural content is impossible to create um, in a way that it's always unique. I think, um, there's you know a lot of like labor strains within game companies that make it that make it for like really difficult for game designers to really fulfill that um you know premise of trying to make unique places all the time uh but even when we look at these unique and handcrafted places uh especially for you know triple a games um there while they might not be handcrafted um, or while they are partly handcrafted, what we see is that they will always use the same set of assets and then, you know, put you know, new things together to make them as unique as possible. Um, there's definitely a balance that helps players to kind of distinguish what they think of, like how they think, or rather when they think a place is authentic. And for mainstream games at the moment, I do not see procedural content or procedural worlds being incredibly successful just yet. I think maybe with a little, a few more years of time and maybe when the Fallout, like the new game from the Fallout creators comes out, maybe it'll convince that, hey, it is possible after all. But I, I, I do think that um, with procedural worlds, it's still a bit, little bit difficult to truly make them unique. I think there's a bit of human touch involved or has to be, yeah. Yeah, I agree, because it's sort of, you get the sense of like, oh, it's technically different, but you can just tell that it's actually kind of the same if yeah. you look at it a certain yes. way. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait for for those procedural techniques to, to improve. That'd be really fun. Um, okay, so the last question that we have is, do you see any connections between game tourism and the virtual tourism provided by YouTube films walking around the back oh. streets of Tokyo? <laughs> Oh, I, I have been very interested in these uh, videos. I, I know them and I, I there's um I, I think I think the main difference I would say right now is uh whereas sometimes when I walk inside The Witcher 3, I know sometimes I'll be having enemy encounters, right? So it's not going to be peaceful all the time. Whereas with those videos um uh, on YouTube, that's really like often it's very calming sometimes you have like these rain settings and then there's like sound um calming your nerves uh i do think it's different in a sense uh in, in the way that they do it but probably comes back to the same premise of being able to explore a space um having some kind of movement without actually being there but being like like participating in it in video games of course there's there would be the argument that you know you cannot move unless you have an active input because you kind of connect it to your computer your you know your hardware whatever you're playing on becomes you know part of your bodily movements whereas with the youtube videos it's a bit more passive i think that's um that's like an important distinction to make yet i think there can be something said about you know the kind of tourism that we can explore through media I'm gonna have to check out those those uh, YouTube videos. I had no idea about it's, them. It's I was like, really cool. like you type in Shibuya walking, and then maybe rain, and then you'll get like a bunch of videos 
uh, of just people who, you know, walk for like an hour or two through uh, a neighborhood and then it's, um, it's very calming. Yes. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And we have just absolutely loved this discussion and your slides and your talk and your research. Um, I've learned a ton. I think everybody has learned a ton. Um, and we were really, really, really thankful that you were able to join us. So thank yes, you so thank much. you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, to all of your questions. It was great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. And then next, I think we're going to hop over to um, the after party. Oops, sorry, we're going to hop over to the after party and um, we are going to continue a uh, casual discussion um, off of YouTube. And so we'll see you all over there. <laughs>